And the title of the uh, message is The Clash of Two Cultures. And I'm going to be looking at that from Romans chapter 1. So let's read from Romans 1. I won't read the whole of it. I will read and then comment on the passage I read. And then, um, because that's better for us to um, have that fresh in our minds as I just make some comments on parts of it. So let's, let's read together Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. For I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Now, I would like to say that, in my opinion... The letter that Paul wrote to the Romans is the greatest letter ever written. It is the most important and greatest letter ever written. As we see in those first few voice verses, it teaches us about Paul, the writer. And it says that, in it, it, this and in other parts of the New Testament say that Paul was a special chosen servant of God. Out of all the people in the world... God chose Paul to be the one who would go out into the world and to bring the gospel to the nations. He prepared him right through life, right from his birth, born into a Jewish family and, told, and taught the Old Testament by probably the greatest Jewish teacher of that day, Gamaliel. So Paul would have been thoroughly familiar with all the Old Testament scriptures. No doubt he would memorize most of them. So he was deeply acquainted with the Old Testament. Then, of course, as we know, he, Jesus met him on the Emmaus Road, on, on the Damascus Road. And uh, he had that amazing experience and his world was turned right around when he came to face to face with Jesus. And then he, then he went away for three years into the, into the wilderness. And for three years he, he read through, he thought through that Old Testament scriptures and came to see how the gospel is contained therein. And how Jesus is, the Old Testament teaches about Jesus, about his mission. So he was thoroughly prepared for this time when he could go out and bring the gospel to the nations. So he was God's man, prepared for it. But then you notice that in these later part of the verses we read, he wanted to, he wanted to go to Rome. Rome was the centre of the empire. He'd gone through Europe and Asia, but he, he was wanting, he was really really, really wanting to get over to Rome to be able to teach them there as well. But he wasn't able to, and it was God's will that it wasn't able to. And, it's, it, and we thank God that he wasn't able to because in his frustration he had to sit down and write this great long letter. And in that letter he sets out for us the most precise, most the fullest, the clearest exposition of the Christian faith that we have in the New Testament. 
The other letters he wrote, he, he, he wrote to churches that already knew him. They already heard, his, heard the gospel from him. And he wrote to them to, to um, fix up particular issues that were in those churches. But for the church in Rome, we have these first eight chapters particularly, which set out for us what I, what I would like us to remember and think about this morning is the Christian worldview. If we want to know the Christian worldview, we go to Romans chapters 1 to 8. And I say that because what I'm going to look at this morning is the worldview that is coming into our country. And that's what I'm going to address today. The contrast, the clash between the culture that is rapidly developing in our society and Christian culture that we have in Romans here. Now, a person's worldview, i just just remind you what a person's worldview is. A person's worldview represents our most fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the universe we live in. What do we believe about the universe? A person's worldview reflects how we answer all the big questions of human existence. Questions about who and what we are. Where we come from. Where are we going, if anywhere? Where are we going? Where are we headed? In other words, what is the meaning and purpose of life? The nature of the afterlife. And what counts as a good life here and now? This is a worldview. And although people don't realise it, we've all got worldviews. Whatever culture we come from, whatever situation we come from, it's what we do to make sense of life. Now, in our Western society, there is a new worldview that is rapidly developing and impacting everyday life. It is a worldview that some call cancel culture. You'll have heard these words, identity politics, and they like to talk about social justice. But I think the most appropriate definition of what we ha what's happening today is cultural Marxism. If you don't know who Karl Marx was, he was a Russian uh, 200 years ago who began the, the, uh, the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution. So we're going to focus this morning on exposing the cultural change, looking at the cultural change. Very important we understand what's going on. Exposing the cultural change that has already come, it has already come to a school near you. Might not be in your school, but it's in a school near you. And it certainly infiltrated all the universities and tertiary institutes in our country. It's also alive and well in the boardrooms of big corporations. So the first thing I want to do is explain what this worldview is based on. Then we will look at this passage in Romans 1 to see why it has come to New Zealand. And finally, what God thinks about it. So... Why has cultural Marxism landed in New Zealand? Where has it come from? And I think there are two pathways. That's just my putting together the story. I'm sure it's other people could, could do it in a different way. But I see two main pathways in which we ended up in this cultural Marxism that has come to our land. The first one is a belief in the priority of self, of me, the priority of self. Over the last few centuries, more and more people have given up belief in God. As you know, they've given up belief in God. People don't want to believe in God. Belief in God is considered to be based on fear and superstition. It may have been the best idea that people dreamed up hundreds of years ago to explain the world. But now, we have long since grown out of such childish beliefs. So what is the consequence of giving up and rejecting God? This has inevitably led to the loss of a moral code that can be required for everyone to follow. People have tried to create principles on how to live without God, but in the end, these ideas cannot be enforced. So in the absence of any clear way to establish right and wrong, what are we left with? We're left with everybody's opinion being as good as anyone else's. We are left with my opinion my feelings, my dignity. And this is the measure of what is right and good. What people are seeking after 
is what they call authenticity. To be true to my own self. If I, if I can achieve that, then all will be well. The nation of Israel experimented with this idea in the time of the judges. And two times in that passage it says, there was no king in those days, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. There was no authority, there was no um, structure in which people were constrained in their living style, and so they just did whatever was right in their own eyes. And that period is one of the most disunited and degrading periods in the history of God's people. It's a dreadful book to read, other than the times when God raised up judges to bring it back into order again. But the behaviour of people was abysmal. So there's the first path, pathway to where we are, a focus on the priority of a sense of self, to live out our sense of authenticity, to be able to express to be able to express my own ideas, and I need people to affirm my individuality. We see that all over the place at the moment. So the second part, that's one string. The second pathway is what I'm calling cultural Marxism. I'll give you a bit of history on Karl Marx, very short. Karl Marx was the architect of the Russian Communist Revolution 200 years ago. His world view was that the trouble in the world was mainly due to an uneven distribution of wealth. You have a few people who owned the factories and the farms, who controlled the government, who controlled the laws, and they were the, they were the, they were the just a small number of people, who, and they were the ones who were getting all the all the benefits of society, and then under them were the workers. And so the, the idea was that the, the workers were being oppressed by these people who owned the factories, owned the labour, owned the, owned the money. And um, so we, in order to sort that out, to sort that oppression out, we needed the workers to rise up and to take over the factories, to take over the farms. And then, if they did that, then they can distribute the wealth and all the goodies um, equally. Yes. Well, anyone who understands human nature knows that that was not going to happen. So what happened? The Communist Party became the people group who controlled everything and set about exploiting the workers. Were the poor people in Russia better off under the totalitarian communist state? Not at all. They ended up with less wealth and much less freedom than they had before. And that's a warning to us. After the failure of communism, professors at universities were not willing to admit that they were wrong. They developed a system called critical theory, which analyzes society and says, it's not just wealth, it's not just wealthy people that exploit the poor, it's the white people exploiting other minority races. It's men exploiting women. It's people who believe that they're, that, that they're only boys and girls and men and women who are exploiting people who want to choose their own gender identity. So these are seen as power structures within our society where people are put in authority. And when people are put in authority, they inevitably use their authority in their families, schools and workplaces to exploit those under their authority. So this is the new form of oppression, much greater than what Marx saw. It's, it's oppression is everywhere. It's rife throughout the whole of society. And, it, and just like Marx, people today are believing that this whole system has got to be overthrown. Oppressed minorities must be released from bondage and become part of a new, beautiful, equitable society. So, when we join these two pathways together, we have people who demand that they have freedom to express and live their, out their true lives, and that everyone must have respect for them and honour them as equally valid. That's everywhere. No matter what sort of peculiar idea you might have, you've got to have it affirmed, and you've got every right to live it out and to be equal with anyone else. And this was joined with the need to destroy everything that stands in the way of my self-expression. 
So everyone who stands in my way must be exposed, vilified, and persecuted. And there is no, pla and there is no place, unhappily, for forgiveness in this system. Everyone who sins must be humiliated and punished. That is the world we see emerging every day. How does this work out in society? Well, probably the, one of the, the, the clearest examples of it was with Israel Fallot, who, um, who quoted a verse in the Bible that refers to the judgment of God. And uh, that was enough. Because uh, uh, the people who were, who, who were exposed by that didn't like it one little bit. And, uh, and so now Israel Fallot can no longer play rugby in Australia. He's kicked out. And now in our society more and more people are being banned from speaking on university campuses or, or, or have speaking in, in public buildings when they have a different view to this one which is that self-interest identity politics. People are losing their jobs because of what they said in their youth. And an, and an admission and an apology is not enough. It doesn't satisfy the thirst for vengeance that we have among this new society. These people have to be sacked. And that's what's happening. And I want to give you, this is a pretty grim picture, but anyway, I'll, I'll give you three pictures, and it's important that we know what is going on. That I'll get, I want to give you three, pick, three um, uh, instances of how this works out in schools in Australia. Three things. In a primary school in Sydney's Upper North Shore, 10 year old students did an exercise where they made Black Lives Matter posters with slogans. So this was an art course, you see, this was a self expression, you know, art course. So, what did these posters have on them? Some of them said, had things like, stop killer cops. White lives matter too much. End white supremacy. And uh, many posters, police officers were called pigs. So this was quite acceptable within the school to, for the self-expression. And that, so these people, these little children, are learning about these principles of, of cultural Marxism in their schools. Second instance, Brewer College in Warrnambool. Warrnambool is a town, I, I liken it to um, uh, Timaru. In, uh, it's a town like Timaru in, um, in, in, in Victoria and uh, our family, one of our family's uh, children live there. Well there, 12 year old boys were made to stand up at school assembly and turn to the girls and apologise to them for crimes committed by men against women. So the boys had to fess up that they were part of this culture, that they were part of this because they were male. They therefore were oppressors and they had to, to apologise to the women. That's second. Now third, Parkdale Christian College in Victoria invited a counsellor to do a workshop on intersectionality. And he told the children... If you are white, male, and Christian, please stand up. And he said, you are oppressors. This is the crazy world that our children are inheriting. And it is because of cultural Marxism. Where is God in all of this? Has God lost control? Not according to Isaiah 40 that we read before, and not according to Romans 1. In Romans 1, we will see that, very, that God is very much in control of the situation. Why has our society decided to send it into this mess? Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So what is taking place in our society is the result of the judgment of God upon our society. The wrath of God is being revealed in these things. This is, and we're going to see quite clearly in the other verses that we follow here that this is an expression of God giving us up 
to our own folly. And this is the, this is the wrath of God upon us. Uh, so, in, in verse 18 here, just interesting to notice the way how Paul has written this here. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, then unrighteousness. And that's what happens. If we abandon God, if we abandon his ways, and we are, we are set loose from any boundaries, then the only thing that can happen is the passions of man will lead to unrighteousness, and that is what we see. Now notice in this verse it says that men are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. This is a continual activity. We suppress all the time what the Lord, what, 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 the truth that we do not want. It's like, it's like having a beach ball. You take a beach ball and put it into a, po a pool of water. And you, you try to push it down. You push it down and you have to keep on pushing it down. And so people live there in society because the evidence of God is all around us. It's inescapable. And, but they, they are continually having to suppress the truth of what is evident to them. So that's what, what this verse here is teaching us. That they are suppressing the truth. Uh, because if they don't, it's going to pop up and challenge their conscience or behaviour. So they suppress the truth. So now let's read verses 18 to 20, and we will see what a good. If we start to see God's commentary on our society. 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So this is the truth that people suppress. The real problem with the world is not oppression of races and genders, the problem is the human heart being separated and alienated from a righteous God. And if we want to make sense of the world, we have to go back to the first five words of the Bible. If we want to make sense of the world, that's where we find it. In the beginning, God created. That's the world we live in. It's a world God has created. He made it, he owns it, he has a purpose in it, and he alone is able to tell us what is good and right. And if we abandon that, if we don't start there, then we're going to get things mixed up because this is his world, this is a world that he has purposes in. And if we don't know that, well, then we, we're going to be lost at sea. To make sense of life and to make sense of the world, we need to go back to creation where we were created in his image, and he created us this, this amazing, glorious purpose so that we would have fellowship with him. In him, the Bible says, we live and move and have all our being. And we're given this unique place. No other creature is given this unique place. We are given this unique place to know God, to rejoice in God, to be, to be every day absolutely thunderstruck with his glory and, and all the things he's made and done and all that he's doing and his purpose. That's, and we reflect that back to God. That's our wonderful place in this world that we have got, granted to us from creation. These verses teach us that we all individually stand guilty before God. These verses teach us that all people have a knowledge of God as we look out on the world he created. It says here, it's plain to all of us. God has shown it to us. His invisible attributes, his power and his divine nature, nature are clearly perceived in the things that God has made. I'm going to give you two examples of this. And there are millions and millions of everywhere there's these examples there. I'm going to tell you one that's, that you, we can see and one that we can't see. first one that we can see 
is that um, in our place in Christchurch, we had a rhododendron bush. And this rhododendron bush, it just grew so fast that I had to prune it every second year to keep it in shape. And uh, anyway, one day, one, one, one year I decided I'm going to give it a real good prune. So I pruned it right down so all that was left was this little stump sitting on the ground. And you know, within two or three months, that stump had produced branches, leaves and flowers. And I thought about that. I thought, how did that happen? How did that, how did that, how did that rhododendron tree know that some monster had come along and cut off its branches, therefore it should ask a few of its other little cells, were just ordinary cells in the stem, to go and bright, grow new branches? And, but it did. And it, so here we have these 20, 30 branches coming out, and the branch would be growing along, and it would say it's about time for a, for a, for a, for a leaf here. So it would grow a leaf here, and, a bit, and further along, more leaves, and then it would say it's time to grow a flower. How did it know it? How did it do that? How did it do that? Um, well, it's got, it's got this computer program. Every little cell in that, in that, in that rhododendron has got a, a computer program which is more complex far more long and complicated than any computer program that anyone's ever created in, Z- in the world. And that little computer program in that cell is able, I don't know, it's, it's got artificial intelligence. It says somehow that little cell knows that those branches and everything are gone. I, I don't, who told? I don't know. But anyway, it knows they've gone, and so it knows that it's got to start making new things. It, what, it was just a cell in the stem, but now it's going to be a cell that goes into a branch. It's going to be a cell that goes into xylems and flumes and all these different things. It's going to grow leaves. It, it, this, is, <laughs> this is absolutely fantastic. That technology is just mind-blowing. We ought to be mind-blowing every time we see a plant because it's plant a seed that comes out with all these things. It, it, is, it is superb technology that God has produced. So, and we see that all around us. It's simply stunning. Now the second thing I want to do, something we don't see, is our brains. We know often look and have a look at brains, but I want to, wanted to, just a lovely little description of the complexity of the human brain. And um, it's by, uh, by Peter Godfrey Smith, at Stanford University in California. I don't think he's a Christian. He's just describing the brain. This is what he says. A typical healthy human brain contains 200 billion nerve cells. Well, there are 8 billion people on Earth, so 25, you get all the people to the Earth together and, and, and then multiply them by 25, and that's the number of brain cells. But that's not the, that's not the most amazing thing yet. <coughs> These nerve cells are linked to one another by hundreds of trillions of tiny contacts. So each little nerve cell has got lots of little um, shoots going off, which are, which are to contact with other neuro- neurons. One neuron may have as many as 10,000 contacts with other neurons. One neuron may contact 10,000 other neurons. Uh. So, there are more than 125 trillion connections just in the cerebral cortex alone. Smith says that's roughly equal to the, listen, to the number of stars in the Milky, galaxy, Milky Way galaxy times 1,500. 1,500 galaxies of stars represent the number of connections in our brain. A single human brain has more switches than all the computers and routers and internet connections on earth, he said. Who made the brain? It's just, it's just, we've got to suppress that truth. People know about it, but they're not going to acknowledge that it's been designed and made by the Lord. Now, I was out hiking. I go to a hiking group every Tuesday, and... um, a, a, a scientific sort of a fellow there was he just he just been had a wee operation done in his in his wrist and he he'd got a problem with um, nerve carpal tunnel and, and carpal tunnel which sort of wraps around nerves I think and he had to have that repaired and he said um, because he'd had to have that done he said so much for intelligent design he said really this this thing 
fantastic, amazing, self-regulating body with all its different parts and complexities. It can't, it, it can't possibly be intelligently designed if one little bit wears out a little bit. You mean all those cars out in the car park? They wear out their tyres? That shows that nobody, no intelligent person has made those cars because the, the, the tyres wore out? So it's suppressing the truth. That's what we have. It's, it's, it's just... So any little thing, any little thing that we can latch on to, we will deny God. So, that's, that's where we go there. Righto. So now, we, we now pass on from the, 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 um, the fact of God being creator... The fact that everyone has got that opportunity to learn about him because we can see it every day. And then he goes on to tell really how the wrath of God is now seen in this society against this willful rejection of God. Um, <clears throat> so I want to say before we read it, that in this passage, well th this passage is, I suppose we could say it's sort of natural justice. God is allowing us to experience natu natural justice. He says, okay, okay, if you want your way, if you want to reject me, if you want to forget what's proper, what's real, then I'll let you live in your own little world and just see where it gets you. And that's, what he's, that's what's happening. That's, and, and we will see three times here in these few verses that it says God has given them up. Because of their attitude, God has given them up. Because of this attitude, God has given them up. He says that three times the, through, the, through the passage here. <clears throat> So let's read verses 23 to 29. That's, uh, to, professing to be wise, that's society, they became fools. And there's a lot of smart people out there. They're much brainier than me. Much, much brainier than me. But because they don't believe the first five words in the Bible, it leads them astray to become foolish. They've changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their hearts, to dishonour their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the, of, of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error that was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, etc. So that, that passage needs no commentary. This is, this is what is happening within our, sadly, sadly within our society today. People are not willing to acknowledge God. They're not willing to thank God. For all he's done. God has blessed us so amazingly in our Western civilization. There's never been a more liberal, more free society in the history of the world than what we have here. But it's not enough. People will not... It's, they still want them to have their own ways and ideas expressed. It's, it is absolutely, it's absolutely staggering that people don't see... The blessings that we have every day, and they just come into this mindset of not having, an, having, not having their way, and that's not good enough. When we, abandon, when we abandon a knowledge of God, we tear down all the boundaries that keep us safe. Everyone can do what is good in their own eyes. This was the essence of the first sin. Adam decided that he would decide for himself what was good and what was to be desired. And all his children have followed in his footsteps. Now Paul now lists a, a list of sins, of behaviours that flow from these things. Before he talked about just the sexual uh, 
deviations that, that people are, will go into once those boundaries are, are left, but also now we see a series of attributes of society, and, and so many of them are, are the result of this cultural Marxism. Look at, look at what it says here in verse um, 29. Full of envy. People are envious. I haven't got what you've got. I haven't got, you know, it's, I want the same, same things you have. It's this envy. There's strife. This is just causing division. It's causing attacks within our society. It's not bringing us together. It's separating us. It's deceit. It's malicious. Yeah, they're not. They've got to have blood on the floor. Um, it's terrible. That, that's. And, and they think this is helping things. They think this is improving society. We go on haters of God, insolent, insolent. They're definitely insolent, haughty. We know best. Boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and definitely ruthless. So that's. Paul was writing that in the first century. He saw that in his society. And we have it today. Where does this leave us? Where do we go from here? That's the big question, isn't it? What is our response? Are we to throw up our hands in despair and give in to depression? You're sort of inclined to. It just seems hopeless. Let us learn from Paul how to respond. We find ourselves in a society that is not too different to the times of the New Testament. Paul was writing to help Christians in Rome. They were living in Rome, the seat of the Roman Empire. Roman society was not too different to our own. They practiced abortion just like we did. But they practice it by letting the child be born and then just let it die. And that's what we're doing. We do it before birth, but it's not no different to what we're doing today. And often, often the Christians would come and pick up the babies and would give them life. But the Roman society, life was not the, the sacred, God-honoring lifestyle um, creature that God has created in their view. Roman citizens had lots of liberty. And they could do whatever they wished with their slaves. So it's pretty, yeah, serious problems in, in, in how they dealt with their slaves. Sexual promiscuity was the norm and commonly part of idol worship. And there were very few places where Christians were welcomed. So what was Paul's attitude to confronting the sinful society of his day? Did he wring his hands in despair? Far from it. And we go back now. To look at the verses we missed, because his hope was in the power of God, as we will see here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he says. I'm not ashamed. People wanted me to be ashamed. People want to say that that's the problem in the world. But we will not be ashamed. We know that that's the only answer to the human need of our society. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. In here is the power of God. God loves to make use weak things to confound the wise. The preaching of his word to transform hearts. That's his, he loves doing it. Not, not the building of great build, big buildings or ships or armies or all those sorts of demonstrations of power and glory. No, he uses simply the transmission of the gospel. That's his delight. And in that is the power of God. Paul knew that the only answer to the sinful culture of his day was to be found in the gospel of Christ. It is this message about Jesus that alone can transform society. And we know this. And there is no need to be timid about sharing the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. The book of Acts records the impact that the gospel had on the society of Europe and Asia. In Acts 17, an angry crowd complained about Christians. These people have come and turned the world upside down, they said. Well, actually, they should have said right side up. But the, the gospel had amazing impact in that heathen society. The gospel even penetrated into the very household of Caesar. 
And if it can do that, it can penetrate into the hearts and minds of our culture. Now, praise be to God. The gospel culture is diametrically opposed to Marxist culture. The gospel shows that I am the problem. Not those people out there. It's me that is the problem. It's each of us that has the problem. The gospel brings God's forgiveness so that we can forgive others. The gospel has no interest in outward differences or status or race. The gospel comes to change our hearts. And through the transformation of our hearts, there is neither male nor female, worker or boss, black or white, we are all come together as one in dignity and glory in Christ. And we have this great unity. We have it in our churches. In your churches, you've got so many different ethnicities. And we love each other. And we live together. And we honour one another. There is no distinction. Because we are all one in Christ. This is the message the world needs to hear and see. This, this, is, the, this is the message the world needs to hear and see displayed in the life of God's people. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grieved and sad to see the, the sad things that are happening all around us and people being totally confused and uh, going into the way that only leads to death and misery and separation. We thank you, Lord, that you have been gracious to us in granting us that we might know that you are the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, the Almighty, the one whose purposes will always come to pass. And we thank you that we can have confidence in the gospel that you have given to us. Help us, O oh Lord, to live out the gospel and that you would help us in our churches and in our, society, in our families to know how we can respond to these things and how, it will be how we can see gospel opportunities in bring, giving testimony to the truth. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us and encourage us. And, uh, Lord, we, we just pray that we might see those impacts that we see in the New Testament of the gospel impacting upon that society, turning it upside down for your glory. So we ask for your help and blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.